on air. Welcome to the second panel discussion in the Russia Talk online program. Uh, for those who haven't met me, me yet, my name's Alf Torrance and I'm the executive director of the RBCC. The second panel discussion will be looking at the future of work. This is, of course, always topical and the gig economy and how governments and business cope with the rapid advance in automation, AI and digitization as a significant challenge which seems to have only been accelerated by the COVID pandemic. We have a great panel today and today's discussion will be moderated by Tom Blackwell, CEO of EM Communications, a leading financial corporate and a digital comms agency for emerging markets. Tom, many thanks. I know we're looking forward to the panel's insights into this topic that affect each and every one of us in the most profound way. Over to you, Tom. Uh, thanks very much indeed. And it, it is a great topic. And, and the good news is that we have a rather stellar cast of panelists to help us unpack it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll briefly introduce everyone. Um, we'd like to have Sergei Churyomin, who's a minister of Moscow City Government, head of the Department for External Economic and International Relations, has huge experience in government, but has also worked in senior positions in business as well as finance. We have Greg Abovsky, COO and CFO of Yandex. I think that I'd say that Yandex was a beacon of light in the darkest moments of the lockdown, you know, kind of bringing us good food all the time, keeping us entertained, keeping us educated, getting us to where we needed to go and a lot more. So thank you. Naum Babayev, chairman of Damate Group. Um, I think Naum's one of the most impressive entrepreneurs in Russia, founded one of the largest, largest agriculture businesses in the country, but it also started a cutting edge Israeli biotech business, which is addressing the global food waste problem and has other business interests in AI, deep learning, and so on. I'm um, great to have you now. We have Oliver Hughes, CEO of uh, Tinkov Bank. Um, as many of you know, Tinkov is actually one of the largest digital banks in the world. And for my money, I'd say probably the best. Um, and has also been developing its ecosystem with a range of lifestyle services across Russia. Oliver, great to have you. Dmitry Sadov, uh, co-CEO of Goldman Sachs Russia and the CIS. Um, I think during the pandemic, Dmitry and his great team managed to pull up some huge transactions despite everything. And I'm guessing using some different tools and digital tools that maybe we wouldn't have thought possible a year ago. Maybe we'll hear more about that today. And last but very much not least, Malcolm McAllister, who's the CEO, CEO of HSBC Russia. Uh, he's been with HSBC all around the world for the last 30 plus years, including the last five years in Russia. And I think it's one of the best and most insightful market commentators in town. So with that, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and let's dive into our discussion. And uh, Mr. Shiroman, I'll come to you first. Can, we, can I maybe ask you to sort of briefly set the scene for our discussion? I mean, we're going to be talking about how work will be different, how travel will be different, how the way we interact is different. What does that mean for you in terms of your priorities, in terms of developing Moscow's external, economic, external, and international relations? Over to you, Mr. Minister. Uh, for Moscow city government, uh, it was really a great challenge, uh, to be honest, uh, to find ourselves in such not easy uh, situation. When everything is closed, borders are closed. Uh, you have uh, the lockout of the main enterprises, small and medium-sized businesses are suffering. And uh, besides, you have huge uh, health problem. Uh, all hospitals are full. And uh, we have to tackle all these issues simultaneously. And uh, due to the research that was made by the, our, uh, one of our universities, the highest school of economics, uh, Moscow managed uh, to take the third position uh, the, between uh, the biggest metropolises of the world, uh, sharing it with Seoul and Shanghai as the most efficient management of the megapolis with a population of more than 10 million people. And uh, as I spoke and interacted with a lot of people, this different business communities, uh, foreign uh, train chambers, everybody told that uh, measures imposed by Moscow government, even they were uh, very strict, uh, uh, were in a way, in, uh, let's say, in, uh, uh, so effective that uh, we did have a very low death rate, uh, even on the highest peak uh, of the first wave. And uh, nowadays, uh, uh, we have uh, a kind of a second wave. It's not really the wave, but the growth uh, of the uh, infection people. 
Nevertheless, we keep uh, substantial reserves in clinics and uh, we also implement very effective measures of supporting uh, not only small and medium-sized enterprises, but also uh, such spheres like tourism, uh, like, uh, like services. And uh, if you take the whole scale of uh, the support and incentives, uh, it's uh, the fourth place in the world. Uh, can be compared with the biggest metropolises of the world. Uh, we have to mention especially that that is the addition to federal support that is already provided to the federal level. And uh, if you look at the international activity, I can say that uh, for sure we are not traveling so much uh, as it was before, but uh, only during this month I, I'm planning to visit uh, four cities. I've just came from Berlin before I was in Hanover. We are interacting with our partners in different uh, uh, cities and uh, micro regions of European Union. Uh, soon I'm going to be in Geneva as we, are as we have a very effective uh, sharing of experience with uh, United Nations and especially with the World Health Organization. Uh, the head of the European branch uh, was meeting mayor just uh, 10 days ago and it, uh, he mentioned that uh, it's really very interesting to organize the session in Geneva that will be dedicated how to uh, keep sustainability of the huge metropolis during such uh, uh, crises uh, linked with coronavirus. Because uh, nowadays it's coronavirus, tomorrow it will be the other virus, and uh, we are all should be prepared for the international cooperation. Uh, in this field, I have to mention just a few, uh, uh, let's say, data. Uh, they are very interesting. During this uh, half of the year, and uh, we have the growth of international trade uh, between Moscow and uh, residents and uh, international partners. And uh, that is quite interesting that we have the growth with Great Britain. Uh, even we are plunged into a lot of political turbulences. <laughs> uh, I say it mildly. Uh, business selects the most pragmatic way how to continue cooperation. And uh, uh, we are quite happy that England uh, find itself uh, in the list of fifth uh, biggest uh, trade partners of Russian Federation, uh, according to the uh, statistics of the previous uh, half year. And we hope that trend will continue and uh, Britain will keep its position. And uh, as a Moscow government, we also try to communicate with all business communities. And uh, I'm really grateful to the head of the uh, European mission in Moscow that we organized the interaction with the different embassies, heads of diplomatic missions, uh, trade chambers. Uh, we are very open to, and uh, uh, we try to show uh, our, let's say, openness not only to Russian companies but also support companies with uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, for sure, uh, we will see the decline of FDI uh, this year, but uh, nevertheless, uh, most of uh, Moscow government partners on the highest level from all around the world continue to cooperate in uh, uh, big projects, in infrastru infrastructural projects, in social sphere, and uh, we are very happy that we even start cooperation in the field of uh, providing uh, the population and countries with our uh, vaccine that is already uh, issued. Uh, to be honest, I also make a vaccine and I'm uh, quite happy that I'm protected traveling all around the world. <laughs> That's well, very good news about the vaccine. Sadly, it, it arrived just too late for me. Um, but um, anyway, we'd like to move on to some of our businesses. Thank you again, Minister, for some important insights uh, there. And um, good to know about the Russo-British uh, trade volumes being up. I no doubt that's thanks to Alf and the team at RBCC. So 
with that, I'd like to come to Greg and Oliver and Nelm. I'll start with Greg. Um, you, you all run in these very, very large, sizable businesses in, in some different fields. I wonder if you can just start today's discussion by looking five years ahead. What do you think are going to be the big differences in the way that your businesses operate, in the way that you organize process, work processes? And Greg, if I may, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I, I think what this crisis has shown us is that we certainly are able to be uh, just as productive uh, working from home as we are uh, while all being in the office. There's certainly some things that are different and some shortcomings. Uh, I think for creative work, for brainstorming sessions, face-to-face uh, -face is critical. Uh, for culture, obviously, face-to-face uh, -face is critical. Uh, but there's also plenty of work that can be done remotely without any impact on quality. Uh, in, in fact, um, I would say that we've actually noticed that our productivity especially in the first uh, few months of the pandemic, uh, increased. And when we did a survey of our employees, 79% uh, noted that uh, they felt like they were actually more productive or just as productive working from home uh, as they were in the office. But looking out into the future, I think what that will mean is that people will most likely uh, not spend you know, the full five days in the office. Uh, we'll probably see a lot more of the mixed regime of where you're spending two to three days at home, two to three days in the office, kind of depending on uh, what the requirements are. I think it'll change the way we hire people and where we open offices and how we open offices and how those offices are configured. Um, so there's probably going to be uh, very likely will be uh, fewer fixed workspaces, more floating workspaces, a lot more conference rooms of anywhere from two to four people sized. Um, a lot more quote unquote um, Zoom booths, if you will, where if you need to have a Zoom call, you can just go in and close the door and uh, not bother people around you. Uh, but I think it also means that we could start hiring a lot more people out in the regions and not have to kind of rely on this um, paradigm of the only place to work effectively is the Moscow office, the headquarters. So I, th I think that's kind of very high level sort of some of my views. That's brilliant. Thanks, Greg. And there's some issues there, I think, but we'll drill down into it a little bit in a bit more detail. But Oliver, can I come back to you? Oh, yeah. So obviously, uh, uh, the position of Tinkoff echoes uh, a lot, the uh, the position of, of Yandex and what Greg has just said. Um, and uh, in fact, Yandex and Tinkoff almost uh, coincidentally synchronized their, uh, their move into the cloud back in uh, early March, as soon as we understand understood uh, which direction the wind was blowing. Um, and what, what we discovered was that nothing broke. So I don't hide the fact that I was a bit of a remote working or home working skeptic before. And the reason why I was skeptical was not because I'm um, a Luddite, uh, I hope not anyway, but because um, you know, the, an organization, especially when you have a big organization, is quite an inert thing. And it's, it's very difficult to build over time, especially with the right DNA, which is just fundamentally important to everything we do. It is who we are. And it's why we get up in the morning and do interesting stuff each day, you know, going to the office or not going to the office um, and, uh, and, and build the business. So it's difficult to build and it takes a long time to build and a lot of investment, but it's very easy to break. So when you're in that position, um, you know, you, you, you think very, very hard about the decisions you take in terms of organizational change and design. And so there was a lot of talk about this kind of thing, especially in tech companies uh, over the last few years and that pressure from staff. Um, it's pressure on HR, brand development, uh, and actually work practice, particularly from the tech staff. And we're basically a tech company with a, with a banking license. So all of a sudden, this happened. <laughs> uh, we were forced into it. And guess what? Nothing broke. As Greg said, uh, it worked very well. Communication continued. Uh, motivation was very high. And, uh, and productivity didn't fall. In fact, in many respects, it, it increased. So we uh, didn't see any disruption to our work practice, to our customer acquisition, to our customer service, which is obviously fundament, fundamentally, fundamentally important to us as a financial institution predominantly. Um, we rolled out products and services uh, and, and, uh, and techs, um, uh, um, what is Shane, I've forgotten the word, platforms uh, as quickly as we could uh, and actually sped up. Um, so, so that was good. But three months in or two months three months in quarantine or in self-isolation is very different to 
eternity. <laughs> so how we evolve this going forward is, is going to be very important. But, but obviously, so counterintuitively, maybe, we, we actually signed a deal for a new office during the COVID crisis uh, back in April. Uh, this will come on stream in 2023. So this isn't just, you know, thinking about what the future might look like in an abstract way. This is actually design decisions right now as to what our new office is going to look like. And the stuff that Greg was talking about is obviously things that we're factoring in. And there's huge opportunities here. So we think of our new office uh, that will come on stream in three, four years time as what we call a, a Dvariet Kulturi, uh, a, a, a palace of culture, which sounds a bit of a Soviet type term, uh, but it, it kind of, um, it conveys what, how we think about the new office space. It's somewhere where we convene every so often to, uh, to, to team build, to create, to communicate, um, to do lots of a kind of human touchy feely type stuff, uh, stuff that's needed for the business to socialize, but not a place where you come nine to five, five days a week. In fact, some people will never come to this office. A weird yeah. paradigm. Thank you very much, Oliver. Now you work in a sort of slightly different space um, to, to Greg and Oliver. So what are your impressions in terms of the future of your, your business? Yeah, it's not easy for us. I mean, because for agriculture is the oldest industry in the world. But I think for the last several years, it had been developing, it had been changing, it had been innovating. We are using a lot of different technologies, but still 80% uh, of our workers we need on site and we need um, uh, the physical hands of these people. We, we have to have them on our uh, production site. And that's a big challenge for us because yes, of course, all stuff uh, in, in offices, we move online and it's uh, not, not, nothing was broken. Uh, everything is going well, but for the physical uh, staff, which is working on, on, on site, we did a lot of things to keep them safe. It's, it's, it's the most, important part uh, for us right now and we also apply a lot of new technologies so like you know artificial intellect we put some special things which control in how the uh, our staff uh, are work, uh, washing hands and if they wash hands not right the, the, just, just these people will not allow to uh, get into the uh, production site uh, we have a tunnels, uh, special tunnels for the people. They come in through the tunnels and only after this can get into the production site. We divided them by shifts and uh, they work in three days and then going back on another three days, testing every day. We invest in the hospital around us to do more space, uh, to do more testing system. But at the same time, agriculture for the last several years, uh, let's say several decades, was really changing and it became a new agriculture because everywhere we using let's say precise agriculture it, it, it's already like a very usual process for all agriculture company we really have ai technology we have a, a computer vision technologies we have a machine learning in all our uh, parts of business uh, we improve in productivity we lose, use a lot of robotics but still the agriculture is the physical hands of people and it's a big big challenge for us and we uh, till now we try to handle it fantastic thanks now it's a, some great and, and and i i know how much of the sort of technology you've been developing that's sort of that's going to become key to the future sustainability of your core businesses um i'd like to pick up on anything actually greg started to develop this um but this this idea i think if we're going to continue to see a sort of further shift towards more remote work. Does that actually create an opportunity to start actually looking for talent further afield, potentially bringing in people who are great but who are not necessarily in the city? And we'll start with Malachi um, from HSBC, and then I'll let Greg uh, come on to this and then see if Oliver has some thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So I think one point to start off with is, is the observation that when COVID arrived, HSBC, like many banks, uh, we already had more than half of our workforce globally working in a, in a kind of a networked configuration. They weren't working from home, but they were working in our back, back office shops in places like India, China, we have one in Poland supporting Russia, you know, because we've tried to build our back office platform in a way that has cost and, and is using those you know, remote channels. Now, those people are probably moved essentially into a working from home environment because it's the mode that they have been working in many years. Now, if you look 
configuration in Russia, our staff here are essentially client facing and that's why we, we, we deploy those people on the ground. And since March, we've been having 90% of our employees working from home. When you think about uh, you know, how we source talent, I think one of the concerns that we had right from the beginning of the COVID outbreak was we, we know that our existing team can work eff effectively in a remote and networked environment, but how can we onboard new staff and, and make them part of the team? But we've been surprised to discover that we can onboard uh, new employees. We've recruited quite a number over the last six months, many of whom the only person, the only colleagues from HSP they've met face to face has been the HR partner who signed the contract on the first day. But you know, because they are young people, they are very used to processing information and indeed forming relationships among channels because that's what they're used to. So I, I think when we look, for example, at our headquarters in London, we think that you know there'll be changes post-COVID, not just in where people work, but also where people choose to live. And if somebody is only coming to the office one or two days a week, they may decide to live in Brighton or Oxford, you know, a nicer environment, lower cost, take a train to the office, you know, a couple of times a week, which is definitely going to geographically broaden, you know, where we can source and where we can locate people. So I think, you know, I think to answer your question in summary, it opens up flex around who we can, uh, who we can, how we can employ them and where they can be located on multiple dimensions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Malachi. And, and Greg, as I, and I, I know you touched on this briefly in your first answer, but is there anything that you'd add on that point? Yeah, I'll probably just give a, an example. In, you know, we recently uh, had bought a company maybe a year or two ago. And one of our concerns when we were buying it is, I uh, apologize for the echo, by the way, I'm not sure why uh, there's such feedback. But um, when we were buying it, one of our concerns was like, is this really going to work given that uh, the head of this uh, business that we were buying uh, spends most of her time in London? And uh, we initially talked to her about moving to Moscow, and she said, you know, look, it's not, gonna, it's not good for my family. My family's here, but I'll make it work. And what's amazing is not only has she made it work, but she's become, you know, just an absolute rock star us even though you know she's remote she hasn't stepped foot inside the the office uh in moscow in you know six seven months um she has just fully plugged in and thanks to zoom thanks to telegram uh our you know internal ticket tracking system star trek or whatever else uh it shows you that you can be just as efficient if not more so and what that means is all of a sudden you know, many of our employees who in the past we've lost to immigration because they've said, look, it's not because of Yandex that I want to leave. It's because I want to live in Switzerland or UK or I want to live in America or wherever else. So I'm sorry that I'm leaving. I'm, I'm leaving you not because of the job, because I love the job. I love the company. I'm leaving because I want to make a family decision, a living decision about living somewhere else. And so point number one is I think we'll retain all those people going forward. I think point number two is all of a sudden, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, we don't have to make people relocate to Moscow to become successful. You know, we used to live in this paradigm where if you want to be a successful manager at Yandex, you have to be in HQ or sort of, you know, you have to be in St. Petersburg in one of our big hubs, right? Big development hubs. I think what it's showing is that you really don't have to, which means we'll be able to attract a lot more talent and, and give this talent an opportunity to develop and grow uh, without moving to Moscow, without uh, you know moving to a large city, but doing it from, from their hometown while still supporting their families, their parents, their grandparents, and so on. So I think there's a lot of benefits for us. Thanks very much, Greg. And <clears throat> Oliver, maybe I can ask you to continue this. Oh yeah, so so we we've had um, one of the largest distributed call centres or contact centres, I should say, because they actually handle far more chats than calls these days, um, in the cloud. In well, certainly in Europe, maybe one of the biggest in the world. So we've had basically ten, fifteen thousand people sitting at home, um, anywhere in the Russian-speaking world, not just in Russia, and and handling uh, customer inquiries, doing uh, various activity for customer support. So that's something which, which we've had for years. It's our own platform that we developed and, and there's nothing new here. So we just expanded that during the COVID crisis and, and, uh, and it was business as usual. 
Uh, we have development hubs all the way across Russia. So as Greg was saying, you need to go to the tech specialists, the tech talent, not expect them to come to Moscow because a lot of them don't want to for very good reasons. Um, and, and so we, we opened up 10 development hubs around Russia a few years ago, and we've now got a thousand uh, engineers sitting across Russia and they're actually outside of Russia. So that's, uh, that's something which um, will obviously uh, increase. And then obviously the, we, what we've just seen from the dislocation, which everybody agrees has accelerated these long-term processes, is that um, we can indeed recruit anybody. So we've had lots of remote work people, not just in hubs, um, but the, the number was fairly limited because of the risks that I was describing earlier. We did, just didn't know how, how it would go. Now, obviously, the clubs are off, so we can, we can just go out and recruit people anywhere. But just anecdotally to wrap this up, so first, I was in the office for the first time for a while yesterday. And in the lift, obviously in masks and gloves and whatever, with, with a, um, a girl on the way down, I said, I haven't seen you before. And uh, she said, yeah, I joined in April. So nobody had seen her <laughs> because, uh, because she was a new member of staff. We've actually hired 500 new members of staff uh, since the beginning of the year. So there's lots of people that nobody ever, ever, has, any, uh, has actually seen. And I said, so how is it? She said, oh, it's fine. So uh, I don't, don't actually want to come into the office. I love the company. I've been onboarded. I understand what it's all about. I get the corporate culture. I get your values. I love it. Um, but I don't have to go into the office. So I don't have to spend an hour and a half on the road each day, both ways, three hours. I mean, that's just a classic uh, uh, life-enhancing situation. And that's what a lot of people think. So she'll come into the office every so often to, to team build and do all the other stuff that we're talking about. But her life has suddenly taking a huge leap in terms of life, uh, life quality. And the second anecdotal thing is you wouldn't believe the amount of people in our uh, uh, development teams who ask me, when can I move to Bali? So the challenge that we have is, you know, they have to be in the right time zone, or they can be in the wrong time zone, but working to our more or less, you know, time band so that we can communicate properly. At the, at the moment, you know, we don't want to be too radical and say you can work wherever you like, whenever you like. And the second is kind of tax and, and domicile, and obviously it's this sort of thing that Malachi has all the time um, in, in a global corporate. So, you know, there's things that we've got to deal with, but I'm sure we'll get there. So we can literally have overtime people working anywhere, which is quite mind-blowing. Thanks very much, Oliver. I, I feel we may have lost the last 20 seconds of your answer because we all started to think about Bali, um, but uh, we're back in the room now. Um, I'd like to shift gear a little bit and come to Dimitri um, from, from Goldman Sachs. I mean, I think it's probably fair to say, Dimitri, that in finance, there's been this kind of prevailing wisdom, in person's better, right? We, sh we you know, we, we've got to do these things online, uh, sorry, offline. Um, but as we've seen this year, it's not always possible, right? And not to mention the potential efficiency gains that can be had if, if some of this is. And so I wonder, you know, coming out of what we've, you know, this year, has the game changed? You know, will we in the future see fully virtual IPOs? Is that something that can really sort of catch and hold? Um, or, you know, what aspects do you think might be able to continue to be online in future, even after mobility becomes a thing again? Sure. So, thank you, Tom. Look, I think absolutely yes. Um, you know, we've, we've done uh, quite a few uh, sizable capital markets transactions uh, globally, including, including IPOs already. Um, so the answer is yes. And I think the, the COVID crisis has just accelerated the change that had been long overdue. Um, to many people in the industry, some of the uh, inefficiencies of the way of the banks, big banks were doing business became obvious long, long before the restrictions were introduced and long before everybody embarked on remote working using Zoom and so on. You know, some of the examples include um, unnecessary travel, just because, it, you know, historically for years things were done in a particular way without regard to efficiency and cost control. Um, you know, using legacy uh, telecommunication system, using legacy video conferencing system, you know, I will not, you know, I will not name the names, but um, I remember, um, you know, a few years ago when, uh, when some of our leaders have articulated the technology, um, and the importance of technology to Goldman Sachs and, you know, um, kind of brought in a lot of engineers into the firm. Uh, we had a conference call with one of the technological, kind of, uh, one of the global technology companies uh, in the world, um, you know, connecting from Moscow to um, a place uh, east east of Moscow, far east of Moscow, and I remember we couldn't get the video to work because uh, you know technology people couldn't agree which one shares their IP first, right? So those 
there was this um, argument and then I had to say, no, we're just, we're just going the, doing it the old way. Let's just have a teleconference using telephone. Um, I think a lot of that uh, legacy um, style um, uh, technology solutions, just ways of doing business are behind us. And that would have happened anyway. Um, the COVID has just accelerated the change. I think many, many uh, ourselves and many of our peers have been testing uh, Zoom for, for, you know, for quite a long time, getting comfortable with, you know, with the security level, which is obviously very important in our business. And in the end had to do a year worth of work in, in a span of a month, I think, to get online and shift everybody and make sure that uh, we are as protective as we should be with the client information, sensitive client information, um, market sensitive market data, um, and that Zoom and other ways of communicate, communication uh, are integrated appropriately into our existing systems and, and, and controls. So uh, I think as a, as a firm, we, we feel quite confident and we feel that we were uh, you know, somewhat of a forefront of the innovation um, uh, in, in the sector in the last few months. You know, us using Zoom, switching on video, actually, this, it's, an, it's still an interesting thing. Uh, joining a big conference call with many entities involved, you know, usually our, our teams are the ones with, with the video picture on. Um, but also uh, using some very unconventional ways of doing diligence, for example. Uh, it's one thing to work for on an IPO for technology company or, or or market offering of a technology company. You know, there's not a whole lot of physical stuff to see and touch and evaluate. But imagine doing a deal for a company that where the which which has you know asset value and these are physical assets. Could be a production facility, could be a large warehouse, could be you know, a plant, could be you know a bunch of rolling stock, anything. So we have deployed actually um, uh, pretty sophisticated technology. We've used drones to survey physical facilities, to record those videos, and to basically put those videos on file as part of diligence information uh, on a deal. So um, it, you know, it turned out that I think we all, you know, collectively, we've been pretty lucky uh, with the level of technology, support technology that actually was available at the time when we needed it. Um, so I think, you know, uh, we've made a quantum leap in, in how we do things and we will kind of continue, we'll, we'll stick to that to a large extent. I think one, one element to mention is that, you know, um, it is indeed, you know, physical interaction, personal interaction, kind of looking eye to eye, kind of not missing, not missing the voice, um, intonation, not missing, not, not missing the, the posture, um, and, and all this other stuff, kind of shaking hands. I think this is, you can't replace that. So we will we'll see going forward and in the future that there will be that interaction. You know, we will still have very sensitive discussions uh, in person, we'll try to, our clients will try to, and we will be responsive. But I think anything that has to do with um, kind of group meetings, um, kind of formal processes, um, um, sort of discussions that can be, could be well uh, done over the phone, I think they will, this will all stay on Zoom. Um, and, um, you know, there'll be a balance, but the change is irreversible, and there'll be a, a lasting effect on everyone, uh, everyone, including, you know, the financial sector. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dimitri. <clears throat> and actually, I, I remember, um, I guess it was sort of in the midsummer, sort of height of lockdown, Greg, you know, you, you and Dimitri had an occasion to talk to each other a little bit when it be your rather successful capital raise. Um, we raised more than a billion dollars um, during the pandemic. I mean, you know, I, I'm guessing you weren't on a plane every day in that, around that process. And so, you know, what was your impression from the sort of the company perspective? Yeah, uh, Tom, I mean, that whole fundraising, we did it fully remotely with Goldman Sachs helping us uh, with offices throughout the world. Uh, I think we had London on and New York on. Um, we obviously, uh, we were dealing with folks in Moscow and folks sort of sprinkled throughout. And I think at one point, I remember the night of the announcement, I, I think I had two Zooms going on at the same time. I had a Zoom on my iPad that was live and another Zoom on my laptop. And I was switching back and forth because there were like two different groups of constituents. So it's, it's as if you were like in, in two neighboring conference rooms running back and forth. Uh, you, and look, there, uh, you know, there's some small snafus that we kind of had to deal with. Uh, but Overall, it was, I'd say, just as efficient, if not more so. Like, 
I remember like our first encounter with Zoom, for example, was three and a half years ago when we were in the middle of uh, acquiring Uber's business in Russia. And at that point, that was like a you know big game changer. And we were all excited and unsure of what this cool new app was. And now everybody's using it. And I think it's, you know, Dima would probably agree, it's just as efficient, if not more so, because you could, all of a sudden, you can share your screen, you could show an Excel, or you could show a PowerPoint, and you could, you know, uh, communicate by moving your mouse around, and people can follow you along much easier than, you know, sometimes even, even in person, because you can't, you don't have the ability to instantly project whatever it is that you wanted to show, like, oh, here's a document, you know, here's this document, here's that number, uh, here's, this, here's what this screen will look like in an app, or something like that. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I'd like to, you know, I mean, one of the obvious questions I think that comes to mind is that, you know, given the sort of the increased role of technology and the fact that much more of this is going to be done online, there, it does raise a question about skills and, and what, what is the skill set that's going to be required and how will that change in terms of the skills that will be required from personnel, from employees in the future, and how do we affect that change? How do we actually provide the training so that they're able to adjust and, and, and to retrain? And I guess it's, you know, in a way, it's a partially responsibility either of government and or of business. And uh, Minister Chidoman, I wonder if I can come to you on, on that point in terms of how, how do you, how can you help to ensure that Moscovites are going to have the skill set that they're going to need to be successful in these companies of the future? Thank you. For me, it was really quite interesting to hear what Dmitry said that nowadays even global banks uh, are using online services uh, to interact with clients, even to be in IPO process or evaluating the property or <laughs> some assets. That's uh, for me, it's really uh, a kind of a great surprise because I'm a former bank. I cannot imagine how we can do anything online in the banking sphere. That shows how uh, the world is changing, and uh, I think that we are in the phase of uh, so-called online globalization nowadays. So globalization is changing to the online, and uh, <clears throat> uh, coming back to our activity, for example, uh, when we did have strict measures, uh, all my colleagues were online only. Some people were in the US in the offices because we strictly obey the measures imposed by the mayor. Uh, nowadays, during this uh, second uh, uh, wave, uh, we have already 30% of all the entrepreneurs and the workers or people who are working for the big companies on online. It's obligatory nowadays, and the Moscow government is going to check strictly how companies fulfill all these restrictions. Uh, we ask people uh, even uh, during before the, uh, the crisis when it, it has just uh, uh, arrived uh, uh, to be as much as possible online. And uh, at that time we were quite prepared to be honest. Uh, if you take for example not only offices or uh, civil servants, uh, just uh, uh, look at the uh, secondary education. Uh, for the last few years, we invested huge uh, uh, amounts of money into the uh, creation of uh, Moscow Electronic School. And it was a kind of a virtual product. Uh, it's an unbelievable library of the best uh, lessons, best lectures, best teachers. And uh, we showed it like a, a kind of a by-side product. Uh, not used oftenly uh, during the process of education. But as soon as children uh, found themselves locked in the houses, it became one of the most progressive IT products uh, that helped us to uh, keep the quality of secondary education. Uh, we have the Moscow Municipal uh, State University that is uh, under the responsibility of Moscow government, and we organize special courses for entrepreneurs, for uh, all the people uh, who would like to continue uh, to work on online. And uh, we have special consulting uh, offices uh, all around the city. We have uh, the same service in Moscow, multifunctional uh, centers where we provide state uh, 
services. So we try to keep all people, even the, uh, the generation 65 and after, to be online, to be in this social activity, because uh, for the city it's uh, very important uh, to show the integrity that all the uh, industrial spheres are interlinked, and when we speak about the support of the small and medium-sized enterprises, subsidies, incentives uh, that uh, we have provided, we think also about the big companies. In other case, it will be an effect of dominoes. If we close, for example, nowadays, again, all restaurants, uh, small enterprises which provide services, sooner or later that will damage also such giants like gas from the oil or others because consumption will decline and uh, the city will be in collapse and we are really happy that this online activity uh, helps to maintain uh, the level of uh, industrial activity and entrepreneurship uh, in Moscow and we see that from June for example to September the growth of the uh, uh, let's say turnover in the sphere of uh, only service was uh, 25 up to 50 percent, depending on the uh, industry, and that shows that we are in the process of the recovery. For sure, we will have some negative effect with this second wave, but we are quite optimistic. Fantastic. No, and I, I, I share your optimism that the skills will be developed. I feel like I, I came to Moscow 15 years ago and, and even then was amazed at the level of sort of technological sophistication of everything around me compared to other countries where I'd lived previously. So um, I'm sure we're in good hands. Um, now, I wonder if I can come to you and actually one technical, now if, if it's possible, I've been told if it's possible to move your camera down a little bit um, so that your face is in the upper half. Uh, it's, a, it's a technical request from the organizers. But um, uh, with that, back to the question of skills and, and, and what do you do? How do you make sure that you're able to bring in the people in the future that are able to do what you need them to do? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Tom. Thank you. And again, I, I want to say I invite all of you colleagues because really, actually, when you have to walk on a field so with, uh, with, with actual people, and even we uh, have been investing a lot of money in robotization and in other things, we're still working with uh, uh, let's say very rare for you maybe and, and, and but unique for us uh, profession like we need a lot of vets, veterinarians, we need a lot of uh, technicians, we need a little, uh, a, a lot of people like this and uh, also with some modern uh, profession I will tell you about it, it's also very interesting but uh, uh, in Russia unfortunately for the last several years agriculture education uh, maybe didn't catch the, uh, this wave of modern technology. And we are not so happy that because we can't have a people ready, let's say, to go, ready to walk. And what did we do? Uh, we built our own corporate university. Uh, let's say that we have more than 60 courses inside our corporate university. Let's say that I can, uh, the people can come to our uh, office and use this even even online if, even if they don't need to come to office it, it can be done online and during the three months we can give uh, to this person knowledge how to do let's say the, 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 he, can, the, he can get one profession small one he can be vaccinator he couldn't be a uh, veterinarian but he can do vaccination for as uh, our animals and we did more than 60 courses like this. So every uh, year, more than 5,000 people are uh, complete online courses. So we, before this COVID crisis, of course, we, we have had a lot of, uh, let's say, trips, uh, exchange of uh, different experience and other things. And uh, I mean, we, unfortunately, we are doing it inside our companies and we are doing it online. Maybe it's a future. Maybe it's a way, one of the way of futures that all companies has to do their own corporate university and create their own knowledge and give their own courses and, 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 and create all, all stuff what they need. But also what is happening in our um, all businesses, like everywhere, we're using a lot of data. We start to predict, let's say we start to predict our sales. It saves us more than 3% and we're trying to do it three days in advance. 
and we start to predict our results. Uh, it, it was very interesting things because we have we have a lot of chicken farms. It's more than 500. It's uh, in, in its circle so more than 100 kilometers around us, and how we can monitor our people. We decided to put, let's say, this computer vision for cameras, and these cameras detect when the people come to the uh, staff come to the farm, they detect it, then they control or monitor all these uh, working protocols. They have to, it has to be done. And what we discover for ourselves, of course, it's a discipline and level of discipline has gone up. But when we start to match results of these chicken farms with the protocols, what was right by us or what in, in actual protocols. And we've um, discovered that the, this machinery can make protocol for us. And our protocols, which was made by ourselves, it, 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 it was wrong. And we did a new protocols. It gave us improvement of productivity two times. That means that one, one people can make two times more and we can pay him uh, much more. And or oh, um, uh, discovery, we, we discovered that it is, this is uh, artificial intellect when the machine can create protocols. And from 1st of the, uh, December this year, we will have new position in our company. We will have a, a vice president for data scientist and mass analysis because we have a huge amount of data. We have a huge amount of different types of uh, information and we want to analyze it. We want to predict all what we can predict. And this also will be a new wave in uh, our skills and even new direction for us. Right, that's an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting direction, I, I have no doubts. Um, Greg, I wonder if I can come to you. I know that Yandex has been doing a lot in this sort of edu education and, and training field. I wonder if you can talk to us about some of the more interesting areas that you see. Yeah, actually, we've seen a, a lot of demand all of a sudden uh, during the pandemic for our educational initiatives. So uh, early on, we kind of try to mobilize as much as we can to provide uh, online lessons for our students. Uh, when schools were initially sent home in the spring, uh, we would uh, provide pre-recorded lessons and live stream lessons from the top uh, teachers and professors uh, to be available for uh, students in middle school and high schools and universities. And then the other thing we started to put on is we started to release a number of different courses on things like data analysis, machine learning, coding, and so on. Uh, many of these courses are paid, uh, some are free, and we saw that there was a, a pretty steep take up uh, in the number of students who were interested in these uh, initiatives. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually kind of given us kind of m more of an interest to pursue this area further. Uh, we started to experiment with some of these programs, especially around coding and data analysis in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Uh, and we see that they're actually working really, really well and uh, are, are, are starting to scale. So I think the pandemic has definitely opened up a lot of new opportunities in education, in online education. Yeah, fantastic. And I think the practicum is a great example of something that's been launched and seems to have been a big hit. Um, I wonder if I can come back to you, Marky. Actually, I mean, it's one of the it's 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 clear that what we're talking about is that you know the 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 offline or online mix is going to change in the future, right? And I think that you know it's it's clear that many aspects of what we have you know done previously were easily transitioned to the online format. But then equally, I think that we've all sort of sensed that a number of things are not so easy, you know, from this sort of, you know, the, the, the creative side, the kind of culture side and so on. And so I wonder when you, when you, when you look ahead, what do you think is gonna, be, is gonna be that split? And do you think that technology is gonna have to be developed further to allow this kind of soft skill, soft interaction to become easier online? Or will that just be the stuff that has to be kind of brought back into the offline world? I mean, how do you see that? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Well, look, I think for six months we've been kind of in a fairly extreme environment with 90% of our colleagues working from home. But the surprising part has been how well it's worked. And, you know, all of the problems that we anticipated six months ago, they haven't really materialized. The mental health issues, the productivity issues, they haven't happened. Of course, longer term, it's not ideal. And particularly coaching and mentoring and some of the relationship building, which is really critical to building a strong team, you know, it doesn't work as well through this channel. So there will definitely be, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a return to the office environment, but we're going to have to seduce people back because they like working from home. We're going to have to give people reasons to come back into the office. 
So I think we're going to have to rethink what the office is for. So traditionally, you know, you've got this kind of army of people in grey suits come in in the morning, like, you know, in the Ministry of Magic in the Harry Potter movies, and people slave away all day long in cubicles, and then they break out in the evening, like getting out of prison to go home again. That's going to have to change, because in fact, I think in future, the office is going to be the place where the fun stuff happens, the kind of, you know, the building relationships, socializing, brainstorming, and all of the slog stuff, kind of dealing with your inbox, writing reports, that's actually going to move into the, the home environment. So we think we're going to, longer term, let's say over three years, we're going to reduce our commercial real estate surface by about a third, but the two thirds that remain are going to be dramatically reshaped and a lot more you know of that surface is going to be you know breakout rooms team building you know venues and places for socializing right um good to have harry potter sort of coming into this discussion but i think it's a, it's very appropriate it's a very appropriate analogy um oliver can i come over to you um to pick up on this and, and i'll i'll just a add an additional element to this question that perhaps you'd like to address which is you know very much around culture you know, sort of how, how, how do you, and I know culture has been very important to Tinkoff from the very beginning. Um, so in addition to this question that I put to Malika, you know, how do you develop culture, retain culture go, going forward? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think I, I subscribe to all the comments that all colleagues have been making um, uh, during this, this uh, conference about, uh, during the panel about, um, you know, the, what, what the office and what the organization is going to look like afterwards. Um, and for us, it's been something that's been a, an easy transition to make because we were online anyway. Yeah? So, so a lot of stuff was being done, done online, recruitment's done online, onboarding's done online, training and all the rest of it. So, so this is kind of like a continuation that's just been accelerated. So now we're in, in new territory, which is how do you keep all this together? That's your question. So, so the, the organizational DNA is absolutely crucial. Um, so we think we can do it. But the way we do it is by having a hybrid. Um, and so the, the actual, uh, the, the, the mix, if you like, between physical meetings, which doesn't have to be in the office, yeah, which we'll still have an HQ, we'll still have various offices, uh, but the physical offline stuff and the online day-to-day uh, -day stuff, well, how exactly it mixes, will it be seasonably, seasonally driven, monthly driven, don't know. Uh, and this is really something that we're going to have to feel our way through as we go along. You know, what is the right mix in order to maintain that um, uh, cohesion in the organization? Um, another thing that I, I miss as, a, as, a, as the head of an organization, it's quite a big organization, is, is kind of serendipity. I try to look for the Russian word, uh, the translation of this. It's one of those English words that doesn't really translate, unfortunately. But it's quite, quite interesting that, uh, sorry about this, Greg. Google Translate came up with um, uh, intuiti, intuition, which is not the translation for serendipity, but it's an interesting one because I, I feel that I miss a whole dimension to my management of the organization. I need to be able to see people. I need to be able to smell what's going on in the organization. It's kind of metaphysical, yeah? And, uh, and I think all uh, managers need that as well. So it's not just about formal communication. And in not even about informal communication, there's another layer there which is somehow missing. And it's that layer, which is probably 70% of organizational DNA. So how do you, how do you uh, create a surrogate for that online? I, I think everybody who's talked about this is, is right. You can't. So then how do you manage that going forward? And here there's some IT solutions that can be uh, um, implemented for sure. Um, and the rest of it is just uh, trying to reinvent, rethink, as, as Malachi said, the, uh, the, the way you, you interact. It's, it's going to be an interesting journey. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I'm going to give the last word uh, to Dimitri to see if we can wrap us up on this issue. Uh, thank, thank you, Tom. I think just, you know, not, not to repeat what others have said, and I, you know, I think we, we share the same thoughts and, and concerns. Um, just wanted to point out something that in the midst of the lockdown, you know, um, you know April, uh, April, May, June, July, August, we found ourselves globally communicating to each other. Um, you know, three or four, five times more frequently than we would normally communicate in, you know, in the pre-COVID world, which is quite, quite amazing. So teams across the globe have had um, daily, daily catch-up Zoom calls for half an hour, talking about everything from clients, business, business won, business lost, 
and admin stuff, including sort of uh, COVID situation precautions we were taking. And people have gotten used to it, actually. So now we, can, we have uh, fewer calls, you know, in, in the Moscow office, we speak uh, as a team uh, twice a week. We have still daily global calls. We have daily client calls, global clients calls, when clients connect to give their perspectives um, uh, to, to the Goldman Sachs organization. So what I think will be quite a challenge is, is what is a substitute of that in the physical world? When we all go back to our offices, you know, aren't we going to get sort of glued to our screens again, right? Um, to, to, to kind of to have a benefit of the new, but now quite common routine of being connected. How do we replicate what we were doing online, offline? It's, it's an opposite problem now. Um, so I think that's a big challenge. Uh, and in terms of, in terms of um, uh, you know, why we, why we would come together physically, I think uh, for, first and foremost, you know, culture, um, uh, non-work related sort of social interaction, uh, mentorship, mentorship and guidance difficult to do over Zoom, difficult to do over the phone, um, and trying to give, you know, a bit of the kind of corporate spirit to new joiners, which is, again, we've been successful integrating new people uh, since March, but I think they will benefit quite strongly from kind of from physical presence, being in the office, feeling the buzz, overhearing somebody saying things and and being, being sporadic and random, right, uh, to some extent, because that's human nature. I think that's what we're missing, and that's what people will value uh, once, once we come back to the office. Absolutely. And <clears throat> we are, in fact, right at, right at time. And so this leaves me. I mean, thank you very much to everyone. You know, this is obviously a big topic because it affects all of us. It affects our, it's going to affect our lives and livelihoods. And I feel like between you, you've given us a, a pretty good feeling for where, where we're going to be in a few years' time. So um, Oliver, Dimitri, Malachi, Sergei, Nam, Greg, um, thank you very much for finding time to be with us. And once again, um, Alf and RBCC team, thank you for hosting us. And Alf, I'll turn the floor back to you. Tom, uh, thank you very much for a great panel, um, some fascinating insights there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will now break for an hour and we will reconvene at uh, 1300 London time or 1500 Moscow time where we will um, restart with the, the third panel which is on infrastructure and the national projects. I hope you'll all join us for then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.